Shalom. Today we're going to be talking about the Feast of the Lord, and uh, we're going to begin with the Spring Festivals of the Messiah. Our main text today is going to be from Leviticus chapter 23. Uh, we're going to start with verse 2. The Lord says, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, The Feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my appointed feasts. So whose feasts are these? The Lord says they're his feasts. Uh, it doesn't say these are the feasts of the Jews. It doesn't say these are the feasts of Israel. It says these are my feasts. And when we think of a feast, we normally think of food. But it had nothing to do with food. The feast of the Lord, uh, literally the Hebrew word is moed. And what moed means uh, it's your Strong's number 4150. It means an appointment, a fixed time. So it's not going to change over history. That's very important to understand. Specifically, a festival that was fixed upon by an agreement. By implication, it means to meet at a stated time. For example, uh, if you're going to get married, the husband and wife to be need to agree upon the stated time, uh, the stated place. Uh, otherwise, uh, someone may not be there at the wedding, and then someone won't be happy. Also, we were to proclaim it, it says. The Hebrew word for proclaim is kara, and it means to call out to those that are bidden. Now, the reason why that's important is if uh, a Brit Hadashah or New Testament verse that really brings that out is Matthew 22, verse 2 through 5. It says, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king, which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. And get a load of this. It says they would not come. How many of you want to be at the wedding of the Messiah? Well, I, I suggest you understand the festivals then. It goes on to say again, he sent forth other servants, saying, tell them which are bidden. Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But look at what they did. It says they made light of it. They went their ways, one to his farm, one to his merchandise. I'm concerned about uh, the church today if they make light of the festivals. Uh, God is calling us, uh, bidding us to come to his appointed times, and we need to recognize that. The other thing is, it says they were called convocations. The Hebrew word for convocation is mikra, and it's Strong's number 4744, and it means something called out, like an assembly. When you think of a convocation, you think of maybe like graduation or something like that. But it's also called a rehearsal. So what the feasts were... They were dress rehearsals for the prophetic events that were going to happen in the future. And so these were God's appointed feasts, his divine appointments. And he wanted them to be signals for his people. As a matter of fact, in Genesis 1, 14, God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs. And the Hebrew word there is oath. And then he says, and for seasons, and there the Hebrew word is moed. And so when you understand that, the firstly, the sun and the moon and the stars, the very first reason God created them were to be for signs and then for seasons. And don't think winter, spring, summer, fall. The Hebrew word season here is moed, the same word that is used for feasts in Leviticus 23. So these were really for his divine appointments, the sun, the moon, and the stars. Things were going to happen on those days in the sun and the uh, moon and the stars. And then they were for days and for years. And so I want to explain the difference. The Gregorian calendar, the calendar that we used, is based totally on the sun. The Muslim calendar is based totally on the moon. But God said, let them be for signs and seasons, and months, and years. So God has his own biblical calendar where the sun and the moon are used. For example, on our, the Gregorian calendar, uh, to keep it you know, up to date with the sun, we have to add a leap day, February 29th, four times 
uh, in a, every four years, we add one day. But on the biblical calendar, they have to add an entire month. They had a leap month seven times over a 19 year time period because the months are based on the moon, but the years are based on the sun. Uh, but the Muslim calendar is totally based on the moon and our calendar is totally based on the sun. And so we need to understand the importance of uh, being on the biblical calendar. <clears throat> now, the Hebrew word oath, which means a sign, it also means in the sense of appearing or a signal for his appearing. So the sun, the moon, and the stars uh, plainly are God's signals for his coming, for his appearing. And the other thing is these are at his predetermined appointed times. If you remember in Revelation 13, 8, it says, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. So God predetermined all of the days, the times, and everything when these things are going to happen. Now, I used to live in Garden City, Kansas, and, and it was right next to a time zone. And so some of the people lived in central time, and some of the people were in mountain time. And so they had to have two clocks. One clock where they would live, but they would drive five miles, and now they're in a whole other time zone where they worked. Well, we need to understand as, a, as the church that there's two time zones, so to speak. We have the Gregorian calendar that we need to have uh, for to work, but to understand God, we need to be on the biblical calendar. So what I really want you to get a grasp of is God predetermined the divinely appointed day, the when, the how, and even what music would be sung at his son's funeral. All the feasts were dress rehearsals for that fateful day on the very days they would occur. So the spring feasts that we're going to be talking about today are God's divine appointments for his first coming. Now, I'm going to read again Leviticus 23, 2, uh, but it's going to be the MBV, the Mark Biltz version, uh, so you can get a better understanding of what God was trying to say. He said, speak unto the children of Israel and say to them, concerning the divinely appointed times of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy dress rehearsals, even these are for my divinely set appointments. That would be a more accurate translation. So let's begin with the, one of the first spring festival, it's Passover. In Exodus 12, 2, it says, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It will be the first month of the year to you. So for our sake, for those that aren't familiar with the month of Nisan, we're going to say it's the month of April, because that's pretty much when it is, even though it will bounce between March and April. Uh, if you remember, in Moses' time, God said we're going to change, and we're going to put the religious calendar in the spring. Their civil calendar is still in the fall. That's why the Feast of Trumpets is the new year from a civil calendar standpoint, uh, which is around September, October. But the spring is when the religious calendar is to begin. And so we find in Leviticus 23, 5 and 6, God says, In the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. Again, whose Passover is this? Is this the Jews' Passover, Israel's Passover? No, it's the Lord's Passover. And then it says, on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. And it says, seven days you must eat unleavened bread. It goes on to say in verse 10 and 11 that right after Passover, uh, on the first day of the week, it says in verse 10 and 11, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land which I give to you and you shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. And notice it says that this first fruit wave sheaf was to be uh, waved on the morrow after the Sabbath. That's when the priest shall wave it. And that's the barley harvest. So the spring feast is the barley harvest. And then it goes on to say in verse 15 through 17 that they're to begin counting to you from the morrow after the Sabbath. The day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even to the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, you shall number 50 days. You shall bring out your habitation two wave loaves of two tenths deals. 
They shall be a fine flour, and they shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits under the Lord. So this takes us to Pentecost. And I don't know if you knew this, but the Jews have been keeping Pentecost for 1,500 years before Pentecost. Uh, and the difference is this time it's baked with leaven. And there's two loaves, speaking of Jew and Gentile. We are still leavened, but the Messiah was the unleavened bread. And this time the first fruits they would bring would be the first fruits of the wheat harvest. And so what do we see here? In Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16, it says, Three times in a year shall all your males appear before the Lord your God in the place which he shall choose, in the feast of matzah, or unleavened bread, in the feast of Shavuot, or weeks, and in the feast of Sukkot, or tabernacles. So three times a year, all the Jews had to be at the temple in Jerusalem. Numbers 9, verse 2 and 3, concerning back at Passover... It says, let the children of Israel also keep the Passover at his appointed season. This is why it can't be done by the moon, because the Muslim calendar, their holidays rotate. It'll end up in every month of the year. But God wanted Passover to appear in spring. So that's why they have to go by the lunar and solar calendar. And then it says, at even you shall keep it in his, notice it doesn't say in it, it's in his, referring to the Lord, his appointed season, according to all the rites of it, according to all the ceremonies thereof, shall you keep it. Well, what were the rites and the ceremonies? Unless you understand Hebrew roots, you don't know what the rites and ceremonies are that God told them to do because they weren't spelled out in the Bible. Some of them were, some of them weren't. In Exodus 12, verse 15 It says, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. So one of the first things they had to do was get the leaven out of their house. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day till the seventh day, that soul will be cut off from Israel. Now that sounds pretty serious to be completely cut off. Well, in Exodus 13, 7, it goes on to say, unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. There shall be no leavened bread even be seen with you. They couldn't even be carrying leavened bread. Not only could they not eat it, it couldn't even be seen in their possession. Neither shall there be leaven seen with you in all your quarters. That's your neighborhood. Another verse is all your coasts. They wanted it completely out. And so what I want to demonstrate here is one of the rights that they would have. What would happen, they didn't have electricity back then. And their house would be dark at night at sunset. And what they would do, several days before Passover, Mama would get all of the leaven out of the house. And then what she would do to make this fun for the kids, so the kids would really enjoy it and get excited about it, uh, because they were also told to teach it to the next generation, Mama would purposely hide some leaven, let's say, under the oven. And then what would happen, Father, he would grab a candle. And all the kids would be behind the Father, and one of the kids would be holding a big wooden spoon. Another child would be carrying a feather. And another child would have this white linen cloth and they would go on this great big fun family search looking for the leaven. And as the father is taking the candle searching for leaven in the house, all of a sudden the kids would be running around and they'd spot the leaven and go, Daddy, Daddy, we see some leaven. There's leaven in our house. And the first thing he would say to them is, Oh, don't touch it. Don't touch it. And he would set the light down and he would grab the feather and the wooden spoon, and he would go over to where the leaven is, and he would not touch the leaven, but he would take the feather and gently sweep the leaven onto the wooden spoon. Then he would take the leaven, the wooden spoon, the feather. They would take a white linen cloth, and then they would fold it all up together, and then they would tie a red sash around it, And then they would take it all outside and they would go to what is like a community uh, bonfire. And uh, it would be like a communal burnt offering where all the neighbors together, there would be this great big burn pile uh, where all the leaven would be burnt in the community. Now, why is this so significant? Well, the candle from Psalms 119, 105 It says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And here the father, your heavenly father has a light and he's searching your house to see if there's any leaven in your house. And then what does he do? The feather, Psalms 91, 4. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall trust. So the feather speaks of the Holy Spirit who is taking your sin and gently 
putting it on the wooden spoon. Well, what does the wooden spoon represent? The, cruci- the cross, okay, where he was crucified. Deuteronomy 21, if uh, he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his body will not remain all night on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God. So here we see the tree that Messiah was crucified on represents the wooden spoon that the, the Holy Spirit tells you not, don't touch your sin. Let the Holy Spirit take a gentle feather and put your sin on the cross. Just as Messiah was wrapped in linen, what does he do? He wraps everything in linen. Uh, the leaven we know speaks of sin from 2 Corinthians 5.21. And so then it is taken outside of the camp where it is burned. And so it's, it's so important that uh, the, the father, uh, well, the linen cloth in Mark 15.46, we see uh, that he brought a linen cloth and he took him down and he wrapped him in the linen and laid him in a tomb. So Messiah was also wrapped in linen, just like the wooden spoon is. He also was taken outside. Hebrews 13, 13 says, Let us go forth, therefore, into him without the camp, bearing his reproach. So what are we seeing here? The father would tell the children not to touch the leaven or the sin. As the spirit gently sweeps it onto the wooden tree, it is wrapped in linen, just like Messiah, taken outside the camp to become a sacrificial offering. So these are the rehearsals that they were doing for thousands of years before Messiah ever came. Now, let me ask you something. Do you remember what month Messiah drove everyone out of the temple? Most people have no idea. They can't tell me a month, whether it was December or November or what. Well, when you understand what was going on, the dress rehearsals, you will never forget. If you'll notice in John 2, 13 through 15, it says, Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those sold oxen, sheep, and doves, and the money changers doing business. And when he made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple. So what is going on here? He's getting the leaven out of his father's house before the Feast of Passover. It's the dress rehearsal. And he wanted to get the leaven out of his father's house. Now, do you, first off, do you understand how important there could be no leaven in the house? And how if there's leaven in your house, you'd be cut off from Israel. Well, when you don't understand things from a Hebrew mindset, and you only understand it from a Greek mindset, you're going to create uh, all kinds of ridiculous things, such as a picture of the Messiah at a table with all of his disciples for Passover. He's got a big loaf of bread in his hand. Hello, this is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so one of the exciting things is that we see that the search for leaven begins in his father's house. Now, in 1 Peter 2, 5, he also says, you also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. So we need to realize we also are spiritual houses, and we need to get the leaven out of our house. As a matter of fact, you know where spring cleaning came from. That's where it came from, was the whole concept of cleaning the leaven out of the house. And that's very important to understand. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. It says, Know you not that you are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. So we can see here we also are the temple of God. There was also uh, uh, leaven in the church at Corinth. We see in 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 2. That it's reported commonly that there's fornication among you. You are puffed up. That's what leaven does. It puffs us up. And it says, don't you know a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Well, we need to realize that a little leaven in our lives puffs us up as well. And we need to get the leaven out of our house. So during Passover, we need to be concentrating on getting the leaven out of our house. As a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, 8, it says, Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. Think of the word matzah. What God is saying is you are matzah. You're to be unleavened. And then notice what it says. It says, for indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. So in the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, they didn't stop keeping Passover. Here we see the Apostle Paul commanding everyone to keep the feast of Passover. As a matter of fact, when you look at matzah, uh, which represents Messiah because he was unleavened, you're going to notice that it is striped. It is pierced, as well as being unleavened. And then in Exodus 12, 3 through 6, it says, Speak to all the congregation of Israel and say to them, In the tenth day of this month you shall take each man a lamb for his house. Notice it was the tenth day. It's Passover was the fourteenth day. And it says, Your lamb is to be without blemish and a male of the first year, and they're to keep it till the fourteenth day. Well, what's fascinating is that it was held for four days. 
Well, a day with the Lord is a thousand years, and the Messiah himself was kept for 4,000 years, and he also was without blemish. Now, I want you to look in the Gospels in John 12, 1 and 2. It says, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead, and there they made him a supper. Okay, a Passover is on the 14th, and it was six days before. That meant this event had to happen on the 8th. And so John 12, 9 through 10 goes on to say, many of the people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. I think it's so funny. That Lazarus dies, the Lord raises him from the dead, and the Jews say, let's kill him again. No, they realize it doesn't work. Now, so here we see now, on the ninth, going into the tenth, since it was the next day in John 12, 12 and 13, it says, On the next day when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, a great crowd who had come to the feast took branches of palm trees, and they went out to meet him, and they cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Well, think about this. This is the tenth of Nisan. And that, what they were singing, comes from what's called the Hallel, which is Psalms 113 through Psalms 118. So they're singing the Psalms. That was their hymn book. And Psalms 118, look at what they were singing in verse 24 through 26. This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now. I beseech you, O Lord, O Lord, I beseech you. Send now prosperity. Blessed be he that comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. So they were already singing this. But what's important to realize that the sheep that were coming from Bethlehem all the way to the temple was led by the high priest. And in front of that was a lamb that was going to be the last lamb slain at Passover that the high priest was leading in. And so everyone is singing these, this very song to the lamb that the high priest is bringing through the northern side of the temple through the sheep gate. But Messiah is coming through the eastern gate, and here's there's this big collision course at the entrance as they're coming into the temple from the north side. The high priest is bringing a lamb, and they're singing that very song to that lamb. But then all of Yeshua's followers are singing it to him, and all this uh, erupted. They were very upset about what happened. So here we have another dress rehearsal. And then, if you remember, they had to inspect the lamb. It had to be without blemish. And so you're going to see another dress rehearsal. For four days, they would inspect the lamb to make sure it didn't have any blemish. And for four days, the Messiah was inspected. And he also was found without blemish. We see in Mark 12 and 13, it says, And they sent unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. And then in Matthew Chapter 26, verse 59 and 60, it says, Now the chief priests and the elders and all the council sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. So again, we see he was the unblemished lamb. And then in Luke 23, verse 13 through 15, even Pilate, when he called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people, they said to them, you brought this man unto me as one that perverts the people. And behold, I have examined him before you, and I find no fault in this man. Touching those things wherever you accuse him, no, nor yet Herod. So no one could find any fault or blemish in the Messiah. This is a dress rehearsal. Now, concerning the, the Last Supper as well, how we know it, actually it was a Seder service. It wasn't something unique or different. Uh, this very same service was going on in thousands of homes all around Jerusalem. And typically like uh, the picture of the Last Supper where you have them with this big loaf of bread, which is so wrong, and sitting at a high table. Basically, they would actually be sitting uh, uh, around a triclinium, uh, resting, uh, leaning upon each other. And... Uh, John was the youngest disciple, so he would have been to the master's right, because traditionally the youngest always is to the father's right. The, older also, the oldest one also has a place of honor, and he sits to the left. So since Judas Iscariot was to Messiah's left, he was the oldest disciple. And uh, talked about how uh, John was leaning on Yeshua. Well, Yeshua would have been leaning on Judas, when you think about that, and the position where they were. But they would have been uh, down at... Uh, more likely on the floor. And reason why they would have done that is because slaves were required to stand. Only free men could rest and recline. And so it was symbolic of their freedom. And then why is this night different than all their other nights? That's a traditional question that is at every uh, Seder. 
And John would have been the one to ask these four questions as he was leading on uh, Messiah. And the questions are this. Why on all other nights do we eat leaven or unleavened, but on this night only unleavened bread? Why on all other nights do we eat all kinds of herbs, but on this night only bitter? Why on all other nights we never dip, but on this night we dip twice, the matzah? Uh, why on all other nights are we, do we eat sitting, but on this night we recline? And so uh, the different parts of the Seder tray, you have the parsley that they would dip, and it represents the hyssop that is dipped in tears uh, in the basin of blood. Uh, you have the matzah, which represents the sinless Messiah that we partake of for our life source. You have the bitter herbs, which speaks of Yeshua's experience and ours to this world. Uh, the shank bone is, represents the lamb that was sacrificed in our behalf. Uh, the roasted egg uh, represents the temple's destruction twice on the same day, as well as what's called the chagigah, which was the extra sacrifice they would do if there wasn't enough lamb for the family. And then finally, you have the haroset, uh, which is a sweet apple mixture. Uh, and that typifies, they say, the mortar to build the pyramids and also the sweetness of our being delivered. Now, in Luke 22, 17 and 20, it says he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. Likewise, also the cup after supper. Well, now look at that. Most Christians think there was only one cup. Actually, there were four cups. And so what I want to talk to you is how there were four cups and not just one. And the whole concept is based on Exodus chapter 6, verse 6 and 7, where it says, Therefore, say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. Now watch these four cups. These are four things that are participate that God brings together for your deliverance. The first one is, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Number two, I will rescue you from their bondage. Number three, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Number four, he says, I will take you as my people and I will be your God. And so the first cup is called the cup of sanctification, where God says, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. This symbolizes how the Lord has freed us from the yoke of burdens and the cares of this world. He wants to take your load. And then in Exodus 4, 22 and 23, it says, you shall say to the Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. And then he says, if you refuse, I'm going to slay your son, your firstborn. Well, the reason why God had to redeem them out of Egypt is because we can't serve two masters, the Bible says. Uh, the word serve there is abad in Hebrew, and it means to work, to serve, also to be a worshiper. So more than just responding to their woes, God wanted their worship. And God chose them and he separated them while they were still in Egypt. Then that brings us to the second cup. This is the cup of deliverance. Well, the Lord says, I will rescue you from their bondage. So think about this. Not only did the Lord want to lift off the yoke, but he also had to break the chains that tied them to Egypt. And same with us. The Lord wants to take your burdens. And then he wants to break the chains that tie you to the world. And again, it's that same word, abodah. Uh, Romans 6.16 talks about how, don't you know that... Uh, Whoever you yield yourself servants to obey, that's whose servant you are. You can't be a servant to both, only one. And so now we see their load has been removed. Their ankle chains have been broken. But you know what? They're still not out of Egypt. They still are not free until God pays the redemption price. And so what do we find now? The third cup, the cup of redemption, where God says, I will redeem you with what? God says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. Concerning an outstretched arm, I want you to think about this. In Jeremiah 32, 17, Jeremiah says, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and stretched out arm. There's nothing too hard for you. Think about creation. It took God's not just his hand, his stretched out arm to create all of the heavens. And yet think about this. What price was paid for the creation of the universe? Everything that we so much value, all the gold, all the silver, all the ore. Uh, if you were to put a, a value on all, all the real estate in this world and all the ore, I mean, it'd be trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. Then you add the whole outer space. What would be the worth? But what all of that cost, what did it cost God? cost him nothing. He just spoke it into being. And yet, when you think about redemption, it costs God everything. Redemption costs God everything. Uh, the, and not only that, it took the same extension of God's power, the same extension of God's power it took to create the universe, it took to redeem you. And yet what's amazing is it, 
The creation of the universe didn't cost him anything. But your redemption cost him everything. It even cost him his son, Yeshua. And so we need to realize the great cost. And also think about this. He said, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. And that's truly how Yeshua redeemed us, with outstretched arms. Now, I want to speak real quickly about the Seder service. It goes on. There's what's called the Masatosh bag and the Afikoman bag. During the Seder service, uh, this started a couple thousand years ago, uh, they would have three pieces of matzah in a, a bag, a matzatosh bag. And it's the middle matzah that is taken out during the service. And they break it. And then they put one piece back in the threefold compartment and they set it back on the table. But the other piece they put in what's called an afikoman bag and they hide it. And it is not brought out again until the third cup. And so I think it's fascinating as the matzah representing Messiah. It's even today in every Jewish household, it's the middle matzah you have the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit that is taken out. The middle matzah is broken as Yeshua was broken. He's wrapped in linen. He's hidden away. At the third cup is when he arises back from the scene when the kids find it and they're rewarded for finding it. And the Greek word afikomen, uh, they say today it's translated as dessert because that comes after the meal. But it literally means to come after or that which comes again. And so here the Messiah is going to be coming again. But it's so interesting how even in the Seder rituals, Yeshua is all through there. And so in Luke twenty two nineteen, 19, when he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it, okay, he gave it to them. And he said, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. Well, that brings us to the fourth cup, which is the cup of acceptance, where the Lord says, I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. The fact that God paid such a great price for you shows you that you should uh, know how much he treasures you. Matter of fact, in Ephesians 1, 4 through 7, you see all four cups mentioned. You see that he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, and he, you see that uh, that's that cup of sanctification. He chose us. Uh, it also says how we're to be holy without uh, blame uh, before him. Okay, that's our cup of deliverance. We also see that we have redemption through him. That's the third cup. And then the last cup, the cup of acceptance. He said he's made us accepted in the beloved. Matthew fourteen twenty six. then it says he went, and after the, uh, they were done with their Seder service, they sang a hymn and went over to the Mount of Olives. Well, what song did they sing? I can tell you the words to the song because they sung the same songs for thousands of years. They would always sing the Psalms, Psalms 113 through Psalms 118. That was their hymn book. So the last psalm that they would have sung would have been Psalms 118. And so uh, what were the very words that were sung at that last Seder service right before he was rejected? Psalms 118, verse 21 through 23 says, I will praise you for you have heard me and you have become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. So here they're singing that Messiah would be the stone that the builders had rejected. And then it goes on in Mark 15. It talks about how they compelled Simon, a Cyrenian, to come, uh, to come and carry his cross. He was with his two sons, Alexander and Rufus. But what I want to point out is that it was at the third hour that they crucified him. Why is that significant? Because the third hour is nine in the morning. That is a time of the morning sacrifice. And so what are we finding? At the very same moment, they are binding the Passover lamb to the horns of the altar on the Temple Mount. They're binding Yeshua to the cross. And what else are they, are they doing? They're singing the Hallel. And what does Psalms 118.27 say? God is the Lord which has showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords even to the horns of the altar. So they are singing, bind the sacrifice with cords even to the horns of the altar while they're binding Yeshua to the cross. At the very same time of the morning sacrifice. And then in Matthew 27, 45 through 47, it goes on to say, from the sixth hour there was darkness and over the land until the ninth hour. Well, the sixth hour is noon, and that was a time of an hour of prayer. And so was the ninth hour. The ninth hour was an hour of prayer. But what's amazing to me is that they're also singing these songs at the ninth hour. And so they're singing Psalms 118, 14 through 16. And it is the time of the evening sacrifice. So at three in the afternoon, the ninth hour, at the very time of the evening sacrifice, again, they would sing all the Psalms. So what are they singing while Yeshua is lifted up, being sacrificed? Look at the words. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he is my salvation. And what's the Hebrew word for salvation? It's Yeshua. 
It says, the voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does mighty things. And who is the right hand of the Lord? Yeshua. And he's doing mighty things. The right hand of the Lord is what? He is lifted up. The right hand of the Lord does mighty things. This is phenomenal that this is what they're singing at the very moment Yeshua is lifted up and he's about to die. And just as they uh, slay the Passover lamb at the time of being sacrificed, the high priest would say it is finished. And here you have Messiah saying it is finished. The other thing I want to bring uh, out is the Pharisees, if you remember, were all upset about the sign above the cross. Well, here's the reason why. Yod Hey Vav Hey, uh, the Hebrew letters is the te- what's called the Tetragrammaton, or the name of God. It's called Yahweh. But if you'll notice, and you only see this in Hebrew, it was written in four different languages. In Hebrew, which is right to left, it would have said Yeshua, Ha Nazareth, Viha Melech, Ha Yehudin. And you'll notice the first letter of all four words is the Yod Hey Vav Hey. So here, right above his cross, is the very name of God. Now, one of the things that's so significant I want to talk about, too, is do you realize they killed, Josephus said, 250,000 lambs in one day. That is a lot of lambs. There were two and a half million uh, Jews in Israel for the feast. And so they had to kill 250,000 lambs in one day. If they had a quart each of blood, that is 62,500 gallons of blood. If you divide that by 55, that's equivalent to over 1,155 gallon barrels of blood. They'd be swimming in blood. Where did all that blood go? That is the question. Well, I'll tell you where it went. The temple was up on a hill. South would go down to the Hinnom Valley, which was also known as the Valley of Blood. Between the Temple Mount uh, and uh, the Mount of Olives is the Kidron Valley. The Tyropian Valley ran right behind the Temple Mount, but it's been filled up now. Okay, so think about this. All of the, they had what's called the dung gate, where all of the refuge would go. They had these great big sewer lines, so to speak, that would carry all the refuse down the south hill into the Valley of Blood. And so I want you to think about this. If people were standing around, they would see this river. They, underneath the Temple Mount, they had these gigantic cisterns that held 10,000 gallons of water, several of them. And all of that water, when they would kill the Passover lambs, the blood would flow underneath the altar And it would flow into these channels and they would release these gallons of water that would flush all that blood and water down the right side of the Temple Mount into the Valley of Blood. And you could see this river of blood and water flowing. So what is that telling you? At the same moment, the blood and water was flowing from the son's side. A river of blood and water could be seen flowing from the father's right side. The big veil that was in the temple was likened into a garment. And something else I want to bring out, they have in Judaism a ritual called Kariya, K-E-R-I-A-H. Like when Jacob thought Joseph died, they would rend their garment from top to go- uh, to bottom, showing uh, the, a heartbreak over their son. And it was a mourning ritual. So what do we find now? The father rends the veil from top to bottom, symbolically of his mourning, his broken heart over the death of his son. That is the meaning of the veil being torn. Now, one other thing I want to introduce here that's so important. The ancient Hebrew script that was used by the Jews before the exile in Babylon was more or less a picture language. You see this in the Dead Sea Scrolls. You can see it on a lot of different uh, fragments that have been found. And I want to just tell you a little bit about the picture language because it's so significant concerning Passover. Uh, These ancient letters were, and they are, a perfect phonetic system, and they're much more. Each letter is also a picture with a meaning. So, for example, the letter Aleph looked like an ox. You can see it on this stone here, and underneath it is like a staff. And that's the letter, the Lamed in Hebrew, or the L sound. And so here, it represented authority. So the Aleph, because it was first, it means strong and leader. So the Hebrew word for God is El, and it was written with an Aleph and a staff because he is the first authority. He is the strong authority. So this gives you an idea of the picture language. So each, within a word, you had more words, picture meaning. The Aleph uh, looked like an ox. In Moses' day, it looked uh, uh, like an ox where you could actually kind of see the horns and the head. But in David's day, uh, it looked more like a, an ox with a, a V and a line through it. But you could still see the picture of the ox because the language evolved. Actually, there are several different stages that this went through. 
Uh, the Beit in Hebrew, many of you know, means house. Well, Moses drew a three-room house. Uh, David drew a tent on a landscape. Uh, the letter He, for example, means to behold. It was like a window. Uh, the letter Yod is a hand. Uh, and so it's important when you understand the picture language, and you're going to see why here in just a minute. I want you to think of the letters uh, that we think of as our own. Look what happened to the Aleph. It became our letter A. Uh, the Bait became our letter B. Aleph Bet, Alpha Bet. And so uh, do you guys know what that word is if in the ancient Paleo-Hebrew? The Aleph and the Bait is Ab. What does Ab mean? Father. Who's the strength of the house? Father. And so they drew the picture of an ox and the picture of a house. So that would tell you that that was father or Ab or Abba. And so you can see how both letters ended up becoming R-A and R-B. Now here is an example of the ancient picture language. And I'm just going to concentrate on a few letters here. I want to emphasize the hey again. It means it's like a window and it means to behold. And then the Vav, if you'll notice the Vav, which is the number six, the sixth letter, you, you see how in the ancient picture language it looked like a nail. And the Vav uh, is like a conjunction in Hebrew or and, and it connects. So what does a nail do? It attaches something, okay? And then the next letter I want to bring down again is the Yod, number 10, toward the bottom. The Yod means a work or a deed, and it's the hand, Now, on this next, the last part of their alphabet, their L to T, I want to emphasize uh, first off uh, the number 14, the noon. The noon uh, was the picture of fish. It means activity and life. So it's very understand that the noon is fish. Also, I want you to notice number 20 toward the bottom, Rosh, like Rosh Hashanah, head of the year. Rosh means head, and so they drew the picture of a head. It means the person or the highest person, like a prince. Sometimes Rosh is translated prince. And then the last letter is the Tav, and that is so significant. Look at the letter Tav. It looked like a cross. In Ezekiel, it talks about we, those people that are weeping, that are praying, the righteous one. And God says, before you destroy all the people, I want you to put a mark in the forehead of those that love me. The Hebrew word for mark there is Tav. So he was putting a cross on the foreheads of the people in Ezekiel. That's the, the mark that they were putting on their head. Now, what's significant about that is look at this. The very word oath I told you about at the very beginning is made up of the aleph, which means the leader, the vav, which is a nail, and the cross is to the sign. So the very Hebrew word for sign in the picture language means showing the leader who is nailed to the cross. Look at the Hebrew word Torah. The Hebrew word Torah, the first, and again, Hebrew is right to left. So the first letter is a cross. The second letter is the Vav, which is a nail. The third letter is a head, which is the Rosh, the highest person. The last letter is the He, to reveal. So the very word Torah means revealing the highest person nailed to the cross. That was the picture language for the word Torah. So you can see why Torah is so significant to understand. Now concerning the Yod, He, Vav, He. If you remember the Yod was what? It was a hand, right? The vav is a nail. The hay means to reveal. Remember Thomas, and when he saw Yeshua's nailed hand, he said, my Lord and my God. The very word yod hay vav hay in the picture language means the hand revealed, the nail revealed. That's how God's name was written in the ancient Hebrew picture language. And so uh, if you want to learn more about the uh, ancient Hebrew picture language, you can go to livingwordpictures.com or you can go to our website and we have, uh, you can order some of his material uh, from us at a discount. Now in John 6, 35, I also want to bring out that Yeshua said he is the bread of life. And in Matthew 2, 1, it talks about how Yeshua was born in Bethlehem. Do you know the Hebrew word for Bethlehem? It's actually two words, Beit Lechem, house of bread. And so here we find the bread of life is born in the house of of bread. Now I want to move on to after Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In Numbers 33, it talks about how they departed from Ramesses in the first month on the 15th day of the month. On the morrow after the Passover, the children of Israel went out with a high hand in the sight of all the Egyptians, and all the Egyptians had to bury their firstborn. Well, what is significant about that? Uh, that is the same day that Yeshua, the father's firstborn, was also buried. And in Psalm 16:10, it says, You will not leave my soul in Sheol, neither will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. So here that's speaking about Messiah on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. 
He is not made of leaven. He will not corrupt. And then Leviticus 23, verse 10 and 11, it says, When you come into the land which I give to you, you shall reap the harvest thereof, and you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And then it says, You shall wave the sheep before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath. So during Passover week, on the morrow after the Sabbath, they would wave the first fruits of the barley harvest. That's when they are waving it. Well, the word sheaf uh, in Hebrew uh, means an omer, uh, but we also know a sheaf can represent a person, and sheaves can represent people. We see that from Psalms 126.6 where it says, He that goes forth and weeps, bearing his precious seeds, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And then in Matthew 28, 1, if you remember, the the first fruits barley harvest had to be waved on the morrow after the Sabbath. Well, what do we see in Matthew 28, 1? In the end of the Sabbath, as it begins at dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene uh, and the others came to see the sepulcher. So what do we find? Yeshua rose on the feast of first fruits, becoming the first fruits of the barley harvest, on the Feast of First Fruits. So we see we have another dress rehearsal. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says, Now Christ is risen from the dead, and he has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Uh, in Acts 6, 23, it says, Christ should suffer that he should become uh, the first that should rise from the dead. And so again, we're seeing Yeshua rose on the Feast of First Fruits as a dress rehearsal. And the first fruits have always been a major theme throughout the Bible. You always had to bring the best. And so when everyone would come, they were also coming to the temple at the uh, time of the morning sacrifice. They were all bringing their best of the first fruits. And the Father brought his best. And that's why uh, the Lord said to Mary Magdalene, Don't touch me. I have not yet ascended. He had to go up to the heaven and become the first fruits offering on the Feast of First Fruits. But the other thing important to remember is that the first and the best sheaf of barley was harvested and brought to the temple as a Thanksgiving offering. And it had to be representative of the whole harvest. It served as a pledge that the rest of the harvest would be realized. So because we know Yeshua was the first and the best and he rose, that is what gives us confidence that we too will rise. Then we see in Leviticus 23, 15 through 16 that they were to count from that day to the next festival, which is Shavuot. It says, you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath. And then they were to bring a sheaf of the wave offering, and they had to number 50 days. Well, this time it is of the wheat harvest. And what they call it is the counting of the omer, or the counting of the sheaf. And they would count 50 days to the next feast. Now, why in the world do you count the omer? Well, counting is an anticipation of any exciting event uh, is always understandable. You know, surely each one of us have sometime have said, hey, grandma's going to come in just a week or there's only 17 more days till my birthday. Well, God wanted us to be excited about these festivals. So he wanted us to count. Instead of counting down, though, you would count up. And one of the things I want to bring out, too, that is exciting is in Luke 24, 49 through 53, when you think of all the appearances of the Lord until Shavuot, those all happened on the days of the counting of the Omer. And the most significant day people remember is the 40th day, because that's when he ascended. And in Luke 24, it talks about how uh, the Lord was speaking to them, and he was saying how he's going to send forth the promise of his father to them. But he told them to wait until they were filled with power from on high. But then it says, he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. Well, what does that mean, he lifted up his hands and blessed them? We're going to talk about that right before he ascended. And then it says that they were continually in the temple praising God. Well, that's something else I wanted to bring out. They didn't forsake the temple. They continued in the temple. And they continued there the whole time. They weren't afraid. But uh, when he lifted up his hands, Messiah did and blessed them. That refers to number six, where the high priest would always, or the other priests at the time when they were to bless the people, God told them in number six that he, they were to bless them. And the high priest would lift his hand and form the letter Sheen when he would bless them. And he would say the ironic benediction is what it is known as. Well, Yeshua wasn't from the tribe of Levi, so he's not supposed to be doing the ironic benediction. And here he's from the tribe of Judah. And when he goes to bless them, Typically, uh, they, were, they would have been looking up at him, and when he raised his hand, what would they have seen? His nailed hands. But the first thing they do whenever a priest blesses, they immediately look down because they think the power of God is going to be coming through that blessing. Well, when they look down, what are they going to be seeing? They're going to be seeing his nailed feet. And then all of a sudden, he starts ascending. So here they're looking at his feet, and they're seeing him going up. Uh, and so it's, it's, it was an amazing event. Now, in Numbers 28, 26, it talks about in the day of first fruits, when you bring a new meat offering to the Lord after your weeks be out, 
you to have another holy convocation. So that's speaking about Shavuot or Pentecost. And again, it was going to be another dress rehearsal. Well, what do we find? It says, you are to bring out of your habitation two wave loaves, okay? And they were to be baked with leaven, and they are the first fruits of the Lord. So this was to be the first fruits of the wheat harvest. And uh, Leviticus 23, 20, 21 speaks of this also being a holy convocation. So again, this is a dress rehearsal. Uh, in Acts 2, 1 through 5, it says, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were, they were all with one accord in one place. That was at the temple. And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Why were they there? Because Deuteronomy 16, 16 said they were required to. Again, this was not new for the Jews. That's why there were thousands of Jews there for Pentecost. They were required to be there from every nation. They had to come. Well, in Acts 2, 2 and 3, what do we find? Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them cloven tongues of fire and set upon each one of them. Well, uh, what's fascinating to me is in Acts 2, 15, uh, Peter said, these men aren't drunk, as you suppose, being the what? It's the third hour of the day. That's the time of the morning sacrifice. So here we have another dress rehearsal. On the Feast of Shavuot, at the very time of the morning sacrifice, you have the Holy Spirit poured out. So you can see how all of these spring feasts were divine appointments set up by God. Now, the Feast of Pentecost, uh, or Shavuot, uh, which means the Feast of Weeks, also has another name, Hag HaKetzur, which means the Feast of the Harvest. Well, when you think of harvest, you're harvesting. Well, what do we find? Uh, we find in Acts 2.41, 3,000 souls got saved. That's a pretty good harvest. Okay, and then what do we find in Acts 4, 4? It says there were another 5,000 people that were saved. And then in uh, Acts 21, 20, it says, uh, when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said to him, you see, brother, how many tens of thousands of Jews there are which believe. And they're all zealous for Torah. So it wasn't Gentiles that were coming to the Messiah. These were all Jews that were coming to the Messiah in Acts. That's a big misunderstanding. The Gentiles weren't coming to Messiah for many, 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 uh, well, many years, decades later. So all of these Jews that were coming to the Messiah, they were Jews. They were not Gentiles. And it talks about how tens of thousands of them, they were still Jews and they loved Torah. And the other thing I want to bring out is this. <clears throat> what were they reading? Every Shavuot to this day, think about this. How many Christians keep Pentecost? I don't know if any Christians keep Pentecost, and they claim it is theirs. The Jews have been keeping Shavuot for 1,500 years before Pentecost came, and to this day they still keep Pentecost. When did the first Pentecost happen? What were they reading that night? Literally every Shavuot, the Jews stay up all night, and they read sections of the Torah. One of the, the very first Pentecost, our very first Shavuot, was when Moses went up the mount the first time and got the Torah. And so they read Exodus 19 about that event. And what's fascinating is, what are they reading? That night, before all this happened, they're reading about how the Lord came down on Mount Sinai in fire. So they're reading about fire falling from heaven, and they're receiving the Torah. And it, was, it says in Exodus 19, 16, it came to pass on the third day in the morning. Right, probably was right at 9 in the morning at the time of the morning sacrifice. They heard this voice of a shofar and the Lord descending in fire. They also read Ezekiel. So think about this. The night before uh, the fire fell on the temple, they read Ezekiel 1. And it says this. And I looked and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself. In verse 12 through 13, it talks about the spirit taking him up. And he hears a voice of great rushing. And they hear this voice, blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place. And they hear the noise of wings. And they hear the noise of great rushing. So they're hearing of this rushing mighty wind. And they're hearing about a fire. And that's what they're reading. And in Ezekiel 36, verse 26 and 27, God says this, A new heart I will give you, a new spirit I will put within you. And I'm going to take the stony heart out of your flesh. And I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. I'm going to put my spirit within you and I'm going to cause you to walk in my statutes and you'll keep my judgments and do them. So what do we see here? This is a rehearsal of this very event where God was going to take the stony heart out of them and give them a heart of flesh. This, that is what the new covenant is all about. But I want you to notice he's going to cause them to walk in his statutes, to keep his judgments, to do them, not to discard them. 
Isaiah 24, verse 5 and 6, it says, The earth is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they've transgressed the Torah. You want to know why the, the world is defiled today and everything is going bad? It's because we've transgressed the Torah. We've changed the ordinance. We've broken the everlasting covenant. It says, Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burnt, and few men are left. It says in Psalms 119, How many of you know David loved the Lord? You bet he did. And you know the Lord loved David. And listen to David's words. Psalms 119, verse 53, he says, Horror has taken hold upon me because of the wicked that forsake Torah. Psalms 119, verse 126, It is time for you, O Lord, to work, for they have made void your Torah. How many today have made void the Torah? Say it's null and void, and they've forsaken the Torah. That is David's heart about Torah. And then in Ruth 2, 23, they also read, The book of Ruth. I think that's so fascinating that every Shavuot, they read the book of Ruth. Uh, Look at Ruth verse 2 and 23. It says, She kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley harvest and of the wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. When you're reading this and you understand the festivals, you now know she began at Passover and worked through Pentecost. And Ruth was a Gentile. Okay? And you have Ruth and you have Orpah. Not Oprah, Orpah. And Ruth in Hebrew means friend. Okay? So Elimelech was the father that married Naomi. They had two sons, Malon and Chilion. That means weakly and sickly. Well, weakly and sickly dies. And so uh, what happens? Uh, Elimelech dies, and so it's just Naomi with Ruth and Orpah. And Ruth and Orpah are both Gentiles. So what do they represent? They represent the church, basically, that marries into Israel. So these are Gentiles that are coming into the covenant of Israel. But what happens? Ruth becomes a friend of Naomi, and she goes back. She works the harvest and ends up bringing forth the Messiah through David the king. Orpah, okay, her name means to turn the back of the neck or to turn your back on. So what is that significant? What is that telling us? That tells us Ruth and Orpah represent the last day's church, the Gentile church. Half of the church is going to befriend Israel, work the harvest, and bring forth the Messiah. Orpah represents the church that's going to turn her back on Israel and go back to their gods. So we need to really be careful about what we're doing. And so Revelation 14, 18 It says, another angel came out from the altar, which had the power over fire, and he cried with a loud voice to them that had the sharp sickle, saying, thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth where her grapes are fully ripe. Why is that significant? Because if you remember, Passover was the barley harvest, Shavuot is the wheat harvest, but now in Revelation, they're talking about a grape harvest. That's because the fall feast is the grape harvest, and that's the next festivals to be fulfilled. And so the important thing to remember is just as the spring feasts were the dress rehearsals for Messiah's first coming, the fall feasts are the dress rehearsals for his second coming. And so now that you can really see those rehearsals, we're going to take a look at the fall feast, and I'm going to show you some of the things they've been rehearsing for thousands of years so you can have a clue of what is to come. Thank you.